Thank you, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Stephanie Garcia Voss. I'm the Director of Community Development and Services for the City of Henderson. If my voice may go in and out. It came back in time, so that's good. Uh, I was without a voice for about three days, and my children kept asking me to speak a little louder, but um, I finally got it back, so hopefully it, it stays in. But we are thrilled to have the uh, Cynthia Bowen here with us, who is a certified planner, and she's here with us from Indianapolis, Indiana. She's the Director of Planning at Rundell Ernstberger Associates, also known as REA, and she is also, she's an urban designer, landscape art, or she, the firm is an urban design, landscape architecture and planning firm in, in, in Indianapolis. Cynthia is currently the president-elect on the board of APA, the American Planning Association, and she's the director of planning at REA. She's charged with technical oversight and development of planning services. In addition, she's a graduate from Ball State University's urban planning program and has tremendous experience in public facilitation and policy-oriented experience. She has extensive knowledge regarding community input, facilitation, and developing consensus. She's a skilled grant seeker and writer and has assisted clients in securing planning grants from the Department of Transportation, um, from the Economic Development Authority, and we are excited to have Cynthia here and looking forward to her leadership on APA as well. And we also have Andy Durling, who's a certified planner and is currently a principal at Wood Rogers Consulting in Reno, Nevada which provides broad services in civil engineering, land planning, surveying, landscape architecture, geotech, and many other things. Andy has more than 15 years of experience serving both public and private clients in Nevada, California, and Arizona. And he has developed numerous plans that address the need to revitalize aging main streets and transportation corridors. He's worked on various projects such as complete streets, redevelopment opportunities, streetscape, and urban design and he's served in various leadership positions in the Nevada APA and current, for the past 10 years, and he currently serves as the president of the Nevada chapter. I'm gonna invite Andy to come up and share some remarks about the state of APA in Nevada, and then we'll ask Cynthia to share from the national perspective. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, hello again. I actually, uh, after taking the uh, 6 a.m. bus from Reno to, to Las Vegas this morning, I had shaken the cobwebs a little more and, uh, and remembered sitting there that I had failed to um, thank uh, a group of people that, that deserve uh, a lot of our thanks for, uh, for us being here today, and that's our conference committee um, during, our opening, during my opening remarks. So if you would please join me, and for those that are in the room, please stand up um, to thank them for, for this awesome conference. Uh, Jared Tasco. Marco, Marco Bellotta. Mike Bow. Tim Marcher. Jared Kruger. Tim Hunter. Chris Dingle. Angela Foos, who's not here yet. Uh, Fred Steinman. And Brock Armantrout. <laughs> and you'll, you'll, you'll sense uh, in my remarks a, a couple of themes, and, and that gets to one of them, is that we have amazing volunteers um, at, at the chapter leadership level and in the chapter. And really, um, because we are a, a small chapter organization, um, we, we live and die by our volunteers. We don't have any paid staff. Um, when I go to the national um, forums and sit there, you know, uh, the funniest one is, is uh, during our chapter president's councils, uh, over the last couple times they've had us kind of get into the groups in our region, which the funny thing of our region is it's us in California. <laughs> so I am typically sitting there with my counterpart, uh, the president of California, and they're talking, you know, they have whatever, 4,000, I don't know how many thousands of members that they have and talking about, you know, oh, well, we've got our conference coming up, we should coordinate, and this, that, and the other thing, and then they go on to explain about their conference committee, which is made up of all these paid, um, you know, paid uh, consultants and other things like that, and so it's just a funny um, juxtaposition of our chapter and their chapter being the two at that table, and um, it's just, it's always, it, I, I just kind of chuckle to myself every time as I listen to all their grand things that they're doing uh, because they have a lot of means. And um, our means are, are much more humble. Um, obviously, we, we are a small chapter, 
and like I said, we rely on volunteers, and so we greatly appreciate those that, that volunteer their time to tirelessly uh, engage the chapter membership and engage planners in planning, um, planning our communities throughout the state. Um, so just to recognize a few folks, um, just to kind of give you, this is, you know, I kind of entitled the State of the Chapter, so just to give you uh, kind of a full overview here. Um, my name's Andy Durling, I'm the president. I'm in my third year, um, second term, um, and will likely have my final year next year. I don't know that I will uh, run for re-election again and, and be passing the baton on. Um, our vice president is Robert Summerfield. I haven't seen Robert this morning, so when, uh, when we do see him, please, Say hi and thank him. Our treasurer, Mike Harper, who I think is the longest standing board member ever. Can we go ahead and say that? <laughs> that it's pretty accurate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Secretary Fred Steinman, our past president, Greg Toth, and also Greg um, served some roles with the, the National Chapter Presidents Council, and after that was done, he came back to, to the board of sorts. Um, so he's still past president, but he also wears the other hat of being a newsletter. So thank you, Greg, for um, for all of our work on our newsletter. Our professional development officer, our PDO, Marco Vallada. Um, so for those AICPs in the room, uh, Marco um, tirelessly is entering our programs into the CM credits um, so that you can log them and uh, you get numerous emails from him with all the different opportunities that we have throughout the state to get your CM credits, so thank you, Marco. And then the one that I'm really excited about, um, when I shared, um, I think, last year's conference in Reno, I talked about how our, our planning officials development officer, our POTO, um, had been vacant um, for, for a number of years, and we're very excited. Um, after I said that, Julie Hunter came up and said, I'm really excited, I wanna get involved. And uh, her enthusiasm and passion um, for the chapter and for planning has been very um, contagious, and we're very appreciative to have her on board, as Fred shared earlier, she has been uh, working very hard to get our uh, planning policy guide out, um, and also is going to be um, uh, working on some exciting things in the coming years to engage planning officials, which uh, I know a lot of times the planning official development um, falls largely <coughs> onto the individual jurisdiction and their planning directors, uh, and the chapter wants to be a tremendous resource to you providing uh, valuable training to our planning officials that are making decisions um, throughout our state. So just to share a little bit, um, this last spring, I think uh, in May, we had uh, a chapter board retreat, which as long as I've been involved in uh, APA, uh, Nevada chapter, which has been I think going on 13 years now, um, this was the first retreat that we'd ever had. So it was, it was a little bit of a monumental occasion to come together. We all joined down here uh, in Las Vegas and had a one-day board retreat to talk about the direction of the chapter. And a really, um, really great things came out of that. And I wanna share some of the highlights with you. Um, three kind of themes um, resonated with us as we, as we discussed throughout the day. Um, those were membership, um, communication with our membership, and then our conferences. When it comes to membership, um, from our heyday uh, back in 2008, when uh, the Nevada chapter hosted the National Conference in Las Vegas, which I believe still is the largest conference um, that APA has ever had, uh, which is something very cool for us to have a feather in our cap. Um, at that time, we had about 500 members. Um, during the downturn, um, we dropped as low as, I think, 230, 240, so we lost about 50% of our membership. Uh, we've regained some of those, and as uh, Fred and his group in their last presentation, um, we're upwards of 290 or so, just around 300 members. Uh, when you count those that are belong to the national organization, and then we have uh, uh, quite a few people now that are just chapter-only members that we have offered as a, as a reasonable alternative. So our membership is gaining a little bit, um, but we recognize that there is definitely a need to increase our membership as we move forward so that we can be, um, become and be a, a more relevant organization uh, in engaging in the state um, all across a number of levels that I'll share in a little bit. Um, so one of the things we talked about is the need for a membership committee. 
we do we have we don't have and we have not had a membership committee um, for as long as I can remember. And um, I don't know if this is I didn't look at Cynthia's um, information. But I'm not sure if she was going to share this, but the the majority of um, membership enrollment at the national level uh, has been a big um, topic of conversation uh, in the national forums lately. And uh, the research is showing that almost 90% of new members coming into the American Planning Association are students, uh, which makes sense. Young, young folks are, are coming in looking for jobs, looking for networking opportunities. But then after the first two years of their employment, we lose a large portion of those. So um, as we discussed in the last session, you'll, you'll hear themes as far as uh, higher education in the planning field being very important, not just for um, providing new planners and new blood and new talent um, for us to hire, um, throughout the state in our planning field, um, but also it's important for our chapter uh, because those uh, students and um, um, folks that are in the different disciplines within the university system here in the state um, are going to make up, uh, we anticipate, a large portion of our membership um, growth over the coming years. So it is very important um, that our higher education system is <coughs> focused on fields of planning, whether it is through a dedicated program or through these other programs that we have to engage in some of the other programs, um, like the College of Business, like um, uh, the architecture program at UNLV, things like that, to get a little bit more creative in recruiting students <coughs> into the, uh, the Nevada chapter of the American Planning Association. Um, some of the other membership opportunity, oh, sorry. Uh, membership committee, um, we, are, we, we, we will be looking to uh, form a committee to focus on and, and come up with strategic uh, opportunities for us to engage in gaining members in the chapter, uh, primarily probably at the uh, student level. So if you are interested in that, we would definitely uh, be interested in talking to you. Allied professions make up another <coughs> important portion of our membership goal, our uh, membership uh, increases. Um, those, the, the AIA, ASLA, um, even um, are opportunities for us to engage to engage other professions um, that are in some uh, that often times engaged in planning. I mentioned students, and then finally citizen planners. Uh, Fred in the last session mentioned um, the northern section has had some success recently in engaging with the city of Reno's neighborhood advisory uh, boards, their NABs. Um, that provides an opportunity for us also for membership uh, to increase our membership roles by engaging citizen planners and, and educating them in the work they do. Communication was our second um, topic of conversation at our retreat. Um, I'm very happy, as I mentioned, to have Greg, um, Greg Tofon as our newsletter editor. Um, we got three newsletters out this year, which I think is, is going, is what we should have, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, we had a hard time there for a while because we just, we had a hole to fill and we just um, did not have opportunities to put out newsletters because it was difficult to find that volunteer to, to do that. So we're very appreciative to Greg. And um, Greg would appreciate for me to put in the plug um, that our newsletters are really dependent on you. Um, we want to hear what you're doing. We want to um, celebrate the good work that you're doing throughout our state and it's important um, for our newsletter to have a, a rich amount of content in it, um, for you to submit articles and uh, programs and things like that that we can with, that we can uh, put in our newsletter. We'll be talking uh, today at our board retreat, actually, or at our uh, board meeting after this, about uh, our overall communication strategy with the chapter. And um, a lot of times, whether it's from the section or from the from Fred at the, at the chapter level, when you're getting communications, it's, it's obviously very much uh, email heavy, <clears throat> but those emails don't tend to have a uh, consistent look and are, you know, a lot of information is thrown at you. So we'll be working um, as a board to unify that email communication and make it uh, a little bit more easier to, to uh, digest. And, and, and I'd like to apologize first and foremost for harassing you with emails uh, for the last couple months. Uh, I, I know you all hate me at this point, uh, but, but thanks for sticking with me. <laughs> um, and then lastly is, is uh, our rural outreach. Rural outreach has been and continues to be a difficult thing for our chapter. Uh, about 95% of our members are in the uh, urbanized areas, whether it's in uh, uh, Clark or Washington County. 
And at the other 5%, um, we do have numerous uh, planning commissioners and planning directors and planners um, throughout the state in our rural communities, and we have always struggled to, have, to, to uh, effectively engage them. And so that has always been and, and continues to be a priority for us, and we've been looking to, to uh, creative ways to engage our, our rural counterparts. Our conferences, um, I think we do a pretty good job in our conferences, and I'm very proud of, of the folks that, that work very hard to put these on for you. And what we discussed um, at our board retreat was coming up with a little bit more formal process for how we do that. A lot of times you'll get the, the information will come out typically in the summer of when and where the conference is going to be. And then you, as we talked in the last session, you have to go to your um, uh, you know, budgets, go to your budget and, and discuss how, how the heck you're gonna get there. And so we're gonna work harder to um, provide you with more information um, in a timelier basis so that ahead of time you'll have the venue and the dates um, set so that you can plan accordingly. Interesting that you know, we're gonna let you planners plan your, your uh, calendars. So we have, we'll be going through a little bit more formalization of our conferences, um, kind of the behind the scenes work and at our session tomorrow, or our um, reception tomorrow night, um, the Northern Section folks will be here and promoting our chapter conference next year, which is set to be in Carson City. And so we're already working to set venues and dates uh, much further ahead of time to give you ample time to plan accordingly and uh, make sure that you can be there. Also, what we discussed regarding our conferences is typically we have had um, our conferences have always rotated between North and South. Uh, and in an effort to look to engage our rural communities, uh, we discussed a potential for a kind of tenure rhythm to our conferences where they would rotate every other year, North and South, for four years, and in the fifth, fifth year and the tenth year, uh, we would look to possibly do a conference in the rural communities. That's something that uh, Mike, when he was on the board, I know back um, maybe 20 years ago or so, it was very common that the, the, the chapter would conduct conferences in places like Elko and Winnemucca. Um, so we're looking to po the possibility of doing that in the future. So feedback on that would be greatly appreciated and uh, we appreciate um, any and all um, uh, feedback on that. When it comes to our financing, our financial um, status, um, the, the chapter is healthy. Uh, I will admit, though, we have operated in a deficit for many, many years now. Uh, we have reaped the benefits of hosting the National Chief Conference back in 2008, which we um, profited uh, considerably fun, from, uh, which has allowed us to do a lot of different things um, without raising dues for many, many years. Um, we've also been able to offer conferences at very reduced rates and uh, been sensitive, obviously, during this, this uh, last downturn to, to the cost of our conferences and cost of our membership. But moving forward, as we set higher and loftier goals for how the Nevada chapter is going to engage in planning in the state of Nevada, um, we recognize that that's not a um, sustainable uh, financial uh, model. And so this last, at last year's conference, I shared about a, a, uh, our goal to restructure our dues, and that went out to a vote and was approved. And so starting, actually it's a typo there, it's, it would actually be starting this quarter, which is the fiscal 17, uh, fiscal, year, fiscal year 17, we will be tra transitioning to an indexed fee system. So that's uh, basically what you pay to the national, 15% um, of whatever you pay, 15% uh, is going to be the fee that moves forward. So that is a, a indexed scale based on your uh, wages. And then in 2018, those dues will go up to 20%. So that um, at the 20% mark, we'll, we'll double our income um, that we've traditionally gotten from, uh, from, our, from our chapter dues. So that'll allow us and free us up to do some uh, more exciting things. Some of the chapter initiatives that we're working on, um, it, it was a goal last year, and, and I'm happy to say that our newsletter is uh, much more consistent and will continue to be so. Um, 
Fred and our engagement with the University of Nevada has proven out to be a very uh, worthwhile endeavor. And the Nevada Leadership Program uh, continues to be a success and the chapter continues to uh, make that a priority for not only uh, engaging in the university system and students, but also the work um, that the leadership program is doing is engaging elected and appointed officials, which is an important aspect. Um, I, I recently, um, working with the city of Reno, they have had some overturn, you know, they, they've got, um, they got rid of term limits, and so they have a lot of new council members, and um, one political consultant told me, you know, it's difficult for elected officials to get, you know, to understand land use issues. They're so complex and they're so um, dynamic that it, it takes a long time for them to, um, to understand those, those workings of, the inner workings of land use decisions. And so we are hopeful and um, very uh, much encouraged by the work that Fred is doing with the Nevada Leadership Program to engage uh, elected officials, especially across the state, to make better land use decisions and to make better planning decisions as they uh, go about their work. Uh, we do have a standing legislative and amicus committee, although the amicus portion of that is pretty minimal because we've never had any. We don't really have a lot of cases in the state that require our input. But on the legislative side, because we're coming into uh, our biennial session of the legislature, it is going to be important that we um, engage the legislature in planning, um, planning related um, issues. And what we have, what we started last by uh, the last biennium. Um, was <clears throat> to work with allied organizations like the Nevada League of Cities was very open to um, teaming up with us. So we'll be reaching out to them as, as, uh, as elections start happening here in, uh, next month <coughs> and as um, uh, bill drafts and everything else start coming in. Um, we are very much interested in working with our, our allies to, um, to make sure that uh, planning legislation is, moves forward in a way that is um, uh, positive and appropriate for our state. And so that's another area where we are looking for uh, others of you that are, that are interested in engaging and helping in that. Um, we uh, would love to have you on our, on our legislative committee and if you're interested, please let me know. Uh, we're continuing to work on our board strategic plan and the retreat this last year was a big step forward. <coughs> we have a lot of issues, we have a lot of um, information that we came up with and a lot of things and, that we want to work on and so we're trying um, to solidify those and come up with directions as, and, and hopefully as we move forward we'll have more and more to share on that. Um, as Fred shared last session, the Nevada Planning Guide is coming out. Woo <laughs> Thank you um, to all of those that have been um, working on that and especially as, as Fred mentioned, Julie, for really putting the push in at the end here. Um, chapter policy guide, that's a, a one thing we started a couple years ago that the policies that we have at the chapter leadership level that we can um, solidify those and have those um, uh, to available so that as board members step down and move on, it's important to understand what has been going on over the years. And so um, succession planning and uh, this goes into sort of a succession planning ideal uh, that we're working on as well. We continue to work with the Western Planning Resource. They are going through a little bit of a time of turmoil. Um, this has always been traditionally our way to engage with our rural, um, the rural portion of our state. Um, the Western Planning Resource offers those kind of rural-based, or more rural-based um, um, educational opportunities. And so we're still engaged with them and, and uh, looking to see kind of what pans out with their organization. Um, we've heard a lot about the importance of higher education. Um, we continue to work with Fred and his group, especially at the University of Nevada. Um, there is, uh, and continue to be grumblings, I guess, I'd say, of a uh, potential planning program at UNLV. And so we will watch that very closely um, to be engaged in those programs and also look to provide scholarships to engage new students in our organization. Um, outreach. Is continuing to be an important um, member recruitment, and then kind of on the wish list, if you will, um, student chapter officer. So as we grow up, some students in the chapter and the young planners network as well. So as we get new blood in, um, those are kind of our wish lists. And sitting through the presentation last, I think I'd add to this this bullet list here. Possibly another important uh, initiative that we need to focus on is the diversity of the chapter, which um, definitely parallels the national organization. 
Um, they have had a standing diversity committee for some time um, with representatives on the, uh, the board itself, and so I think that would be an important, important initiative um, that we'll be discussing in the future. And with that, that concludes my remarks, and I don't know if we want to take questions now or just wait till after, maybe. <coughs> Thank you. Um. All right, let's start this again. Good morning to you all. Good morning. Good. I'm glad. Whoa, whoa. Let's, let's put this out here. Good. I'm glad you guys are awake. I'd like to know that um, I'm talking to some folks who are listening. Hopefully, I know we're throwing a lot of numbers at you this morning, and that kind of makes you sleepy, but. Um, hopefully, uh, our, our talk will lead to some new things here in Nevada. Well, I'm very pleased to be here on behalf of the American Planning Association, and I'm really excited to see the partnership between the APA Nevada chapter and the Nevada State College, University of Na Nevada, Reno, and UNLV. Um, I think this partnership is very critical. And as part of my presidency, I would like to continue to strengthen those relationships between APA, its chapters, its divisions, and the universities, both the faculty as well as with the students. I think this partnership is critical to the future of APA and the continued development and education of the students and practitioners. You know, while APA certainly cares about what our members think, um, and we value what they think. This morning, I took a little bit different approach, um, you know, especially in light of some of the comments here, as many of you mentioned this morning, you know, not only is it critical about us getting out and letting other professional planners know there's an organization that supports them, we also need to understand how the public perceives us and how we can better educate the public. You know, how do we continue to evolve as chapters and as a national organization to ensure that we're relevant to our members and the overall public? How do we continue to promote the importance of planning and creating resilient, lasting communities of value and enhance the quality of life of citizens and the business community? You know, as we just heard from the presentation before us, members of your chapter have identified a wide range of challenges planners in North America, and frankly all around the world, will have to continue to address throughout the country. We are at a crossroads in this country where in some places planning is under attack by state and federal legislators who do not understand the impacts of the laws that they make. Even closer to home, citizens who are residents to change try to stay afloat in the ever-changing economic cycle scared about their rights being taken away, and unsettled by the political climate at all levels of government. But you know what? There is hope. Beneath all this turmoil and the change that's occurring, the public does agree that planners have the skills and training to solve their community and the world's challenges of a diversifying population, climate change, technological advancements, making communities more sustainable, and energy independence. Every couple of years, APA conducts a poll of Americans regarding their views about various aspects of planning. In 2012, we conducted a poll regarding public perceptions called Planning in America, Perceptions and Priorities. This was in response to the tax and challenges on planning and other local governments coming from critics of the Tea Party and others. I'm sure many of you remember that and are still facing that today. In 2014, however, APA conducted another wide-ranging national survey called Investing in Place. We know as planners that if you focus on amenity infrastructure within a community, this is a driver for economic development to attract new businesses and new residents to your community. This survey provides the support for that. It, is, it found that millennials and baby boomers want cities focusing less on recruiting new companies and more on investing in new transportation options, walkable communities, and making the area as attractive as possible. 
The poll also showed the perceived importance of shared economies, high-speed internet across their communities, and housing where they can live as they grow older. APA's 2014 research poll was designed to probe in more depth the relationship between planning in local communities in the spurring of economic development. And again, we also know too that that really is the key area when you can drill down to the numbers that that's how you kind of thwart some of the claims of some of the Tea Partyists or others who, who claim we shouldn't be planning for our communities. The poll helps us understand how two key demographic groups, the millennials who are considered age 21 to 34, and the active boomers, which are considered the age groups of 50 to 65, with at least some college across all communities, urban, suburban, small town, and rural, perceive their economic future in terms of place and community. You know, Gen X cohorts, which are 35 to 49, is also included in this study, so those of you that are Generation X, I don't want you to think we were left out. <laughs> Um, this works on building the analysis of these population groups conducted by a range of other organizations, including the Pew Research Center and AARP. In addition, much has been written and speculated about the changing attitudes of these two groups and the impact they will have on planning and economic development for communities both large and small. What is concerning to me about this study is that while this poll was conducted in 2014, the results still mirror the beliefs and feelings of millennials and boomers. And I believe, in fact, if you were to conduct this poll here at the end of 2016, we would find that a lot of these concerns that are represented in this poll are still present today. So even two years later, the attitudes have not changed much. This study research reveals the potential for a new economics of place in placemaking. Successful economic development policies will likely need to focus strongly on the qualities that make a community or region attractive. The last several years of economic conditions have challenged planners and other local leaders to consider new models of economic development. Adults surveyed have lost confidence in the national economy. 68% feel that the U.S. economy is fundamentally flawed. Millennials and active boomers have serious concerns about their personal finances. These issues of affordability, cost of living, savings, and debt loom large. However, despite the extended blow from the Great Recession, both of these classes are critical to the future growth and community competitiveness given their key characteristics such as personal mobility, potential for new household information, and their importance as a vital talent pool for the economy. Additionally, the community and lifestyle preferences for these two groups could have important implications for patterns of growth and development in all of our communities. Not surprising, one of the most striking findings of this survey is the sharp decline across demographic groups of interest in traditional, auto-dependent suburban living. Fewer than 10% of millennials, the Gen Xers, or active boomers see themselves in this type of community in the future, despite 40% of them living there today. Responses to this survey strongly suggest that economic uncertainty and anxiety about the future continues to figure prominently in the American mind. At the same time, there are indications about the potential for future personal mobility, and economic growth. This is especially critical as planners figure out how to plan for the driverless car. That could be very beneficial to me, I'm telling you. Based on the attitudes and preferences of these key generations, communities that are successful in this economic climate are likely to be those who embrace economic development as centered around issues of place, particularly access, affordability, proximity to walkability, and innovation. More than five years removed from the depths of the Great Recession, economic confidence remains low, and anxiety surrounding key personal economic concerns 
such as savings, debt, affordability, is high. A significant majority finds the U.S. economy to be flawed, and only about one-third are optimistic about the progress of the national economy over the next five years. Millennials are particularly concerned, with three-quarters of them saying that the overall economy is flawed, and 69% saying it will stay the same or get worse over the next five years. That concern is also echoed by the active boomers, with 42% of them predicting worsening of conditions. Urbanites are more optimistic about the future of the U.S. economy than others, with only 45% of them foreseeing improvement. Nationally, nearly six in 10 see too few personal economic opportunities. Perhaps surprisingly, the same number believes they are behind where they thought they would be in terms of personal finances. Recent economic data shows that while the U.S. economy is recovering, it's slow to recover, and with that uncertainty and political leadership, undoubtedly these factors factor into the public mood on the macroeconomic health. While many remain skeptical of the national economic outlook, there is greater optimism about the prospects for local and personal progress over the next five years. There seems to be a disconnect between the perceptions of the national climate and the potential for progress individual communities and regions will expect. Overall, 39% see local economies improving over the next five years, and almost half believe their personal financial situation will improve. So the local communities and the regions expect improvement over where people at the na think our national government or our national finances are. Millennials are the most optimistic about their personal finance future and active boomers are more bullish on the local economy scene. As key demographic groups, particularly millennials, seek economic opportunities, the desire to move to po in is poised to rise. The growth and mobility will likely make the attributes of local communities important drivers of economic growth. It is potentially important that 44% of them plan to move. This could Pretend, or pretend important shifts in the housing market demands in the near term. A new view of economic development is emerging that emphasizes local improvements and investments in the quality of communities and neighborhoods. While economic performance is cause for many to worry, it is the shape and nature of communities that appear likely to drive personal mobility and create opportunities for local development. Two-thirds of those surveyed believe investing in schools and community features, such as transportation choice and walkable areas, is a better way to grow the economy than investment in recruiting companies. This is especially true of millennials, among whom nearly three-quarters share this opinion. <coughs> Growing through local investment is seen as the best economic development strategy. The top approaches to economic development among respondents are supporting existing businesses, improving education and job training, and encouraging smart, smart startup businesses. So, in summary, really focusing on the local economic growth and entrepreneurialism. Not surprising, younger respondents are significantly more likely to expect to move in the next five years. Key metropolitan features, including educational opportunities, public transportation, and safe streets are particularly important to those millennials surveyed. While more than four in 10 of all these adults cite these qualities as important in choosing a location, nearly six in 10 millennials hold that view. Urbanites are more likely than the national average to value metro features and community health. The value of diversity is also noteworthy. 43% of respondents say diversity in people and generations is an important component of a successful community. 
active boomers hold this view with 44% valuing diversity. And this sent sentiment may make planning interge intergenerational living an important economic development strategy. Job prospects and economic health are not only the factors for choosing where to live, quality of life features such as transportation options, affordability, parks, local vitality, health, and presence of friends and family are equally or more important than pure economic considerations. I don't know, my economist down at the other end of the table. <laughs> Might take some, some, some personal with our with my comments here. Not surprising, <laughs> job prospects rank tops amongst the millennials. However, active boomers are most concerned with the attributes and amenities of a community. Less than 10% see the overall economic health of an area as the most important relocation factor. Since communities are becoming very aware of these quality of life factors driving more people to really analyze this community or their community to see what it offers beyond just jobs. This sets up, if you will, a competitiveness between communities to ensure that their amenity infrastructure is more robust in order to attract both new businesses and new residents. Survey respondents strongly suggested preferences for more options and accessibility in where they live. Rated last by all groups was living in a suburb where you had to drive most places. While at the same time, they favored more investment in new sidewalks and pedestrian crossings, more important than new roads, and second only to the maintenance of existing roads and transportation systems. Clear majorities of both the millennials and active boomers survey said that there are not enough alternatives where they live for those who can't or don't drive a car. Three out of four of those surveyed from rural areas expressed the same opinion, as did 59% of those in suburbs and 53% in small towns. Just under half from urban areas, 49% of them, also agreed non-call car alternatives are lacking. An even larger percentage, 81% of millennials and 77% of active boomers said affordable and convenient transportation alternatives to the car were at least somewhat important when deciding where to live and work. More than four out of every 10 millennials said alternatives to the car were either very important or extremely important, as did 50% of respondents who live in rural areas. <coughs> Overall, there was a 15% decline when comparing use of their car as today's primary form of transportation, which, is, which was at 86%, versus in the future, 71%. Car use was the only mode projected by respondents to decline. When comparing transit, walking, and bicycling as the primary forms of transportation between now and the future, transit increased in five percentage of points, walking five percentage of points, and bicycling increased three percentage points. Once a month use for transit doubled when compared comparing today with the future. So today, only 26% of them use transit versus they're saying in the future, 52% would be using transit. Use of a bike at least once a month nearly doubled from today, from 14% to 26% in the future. When asked about high priorities for metro areas, active boomers cited safe streets at 79% as their highest priority, with high-speed internet access and affordable housing equally at 65% each. Millennials also ranked safe streets first at 76%, with affordable housing second at 71%, and internet service third with 58%. And the Generation Xers also ranked safe streets first 
housing second, and internet service third. So as you can see, the, the rise of technology is really impacting the role within our communities and where people think in terms of where they want to live. These same three metro features were also cited in the same order by three of the four different types of communities, urban, suburban, and town, and each of the four regions throughout the United States. So as you can see, these generations are almost exactly the same in terms of their preferences, only a few slight pointy percentage points different. And they're likely influenced by their life cycle and the importance of these features to their daily lives. In terms of aging in place, there's still more work to be done and improved policies are needed. In addition to the demand for transportation options and overall walkability of neighborhoods, majorities also say it's important to be able to grow older in the place where they currently live. A clear majority also said that being able to stay in their current home as they got older was at least somewhat important. 69% of active boomers agreed with this choice, as did 60% of Generation Xers and 52% of Millennials. Majorities across all types of communities and regions noted the importance of what is sometimes referred to as aging in place. Almost half of all respondents do not feel their community is doing enough to support aging in place as a viable option. Additionally, many have or expect extreme weather and wide majorities believe communities must plan well to protect people and property from these natural hazards. All three age groups cited affordable housing as their second highest priority behind safe streets when considering metro features. Millennials gave it 71%, followed by active boomers with 65%, and generation Xers with 57%. Those surveyed from urban, suburban, and small towns also cited affordable housing, second only to safe streets. The emerging sharing economy is particularly of interest to millennials, but attracts important support from other groups as well. Nearly three-fourths of the millennials said the sharing economy was at least somewhat important to them as compared with 57% of Generation Xers and 46% of active boomers. One in five millennials said the sharing economy was very important or extremely important. Also, the number living in urban areas who said the sharing economy as least somewhat important was 67%, 20 points higher than its rank by those living in small towns. 59% set from suburbs that it was at least somewhat important. Oh, that didn't show up very well there. <laughs> you guys can generally see the outline of the United States, right? You can kind of make some assumptions here. 44% of the respondents were somewhat to extremely likely to move in the next five years. I think that's pretty significant. 15 of more than 300 U.S. metro areas were named most significant. So those, because I know you're not going to be able to read the text, you can surmise where these dots are, but San Diego, California, New York, New York, Boston, Massachusetts, Denver or Boulder, Colorado, San Francisco, California, Seattle, Washington, Chicago, Illinois, Los Angeles, California, Portland, Oregon, Washington, D.C., Austin, Texas, Phoenix, Arizona, Charlotte, North Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, and Miami, Florida. While much has been written about potential competition between millennials and boomers, the results of this survey suggest a more unified view of the economy and more alignment about investment in the community that may form the basis of a new strategy for jump-starting economic growth and more effective competition for talent attraction. Vast majorities of both groups see the U.S. economy in similar ways. 
For example, 75% of millennials and 65% of active boomers express the feeling that it, the economy is fundamentally flawed. And at least 80% of both generations believe living expenses to be a main factor in making, making relocation decisions. As one might expect, boomers and millennials' top concern is their savings. Both express anxiety about their economic position and opportunities. Active boomers and millennials' top concern is about, oh, I already said that, didn't I? My cut and paste job is not so good sometimes as a planner. Both groups believe that investing in local schools and community features, such as transportation choice, walkable areas, and making the area as attractive as possible the best way to grow the economy, rather than investing in recruiting, recruiting companies to move to their area. So taken together, these economic and community planning trends, lack of confidence in the existing economy, higher degree of potential for moving, a focus on community features and not just jobs, the importance of cost of living factors, decline in drive-only suburban living, exploding demand for increased walkability, and concern over lack of non-car transportation choices present a new urgency towards development patterns that transcend the old sprawl versus downtown living paradigm and that recognize the importance of walkability, providing lower cost of expenses, and increasing family state savings and strengthening our economy. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Stephanie so we can have a good conversation. Thank you, everyone. So as I was listening to the presentations, I really thought about you know, how are we as an organization going to continue to be relevant, but also how are we as a community going to continue to be relevant and taking a look at that diversity. So one of the things that came up during uh, Cynthia's presentation was how are we addressing things to make our community relevant to the, to the baby boomers, to the, gen, to the millennials who are trying to move here and continue to uh, do that. How, what are we doing and what can we do to continue to promote affordable housing if economics is important and economic opportunities? I'm going to ask the panel. Um, I see a, a level of excitement over here. <laughs> we, we, figured, we figured we'd ask the millennial. <laughs> well, you know, and how many, how many millennials do we have in the room? We really do want to hear from you. And, and then on the other end of the spectrum, how many baby boomers do we have? Really, we want to hear from you. So, if, and if anybody in the audience has any responses, but what are the things that we can tangibly be doing in our profession to be increasing the opportunities for affordable housing? When affordable housing projects come up in my community, there's typically a great degree of nimbyism. Well, uh, sort of prereq for millennials want job prospects. <laughs> it sounds pretty simple, but we're not going to move anywhere unless there's a job waiting for us. But uh, sort of everything else, affordable housing, um, like being prepared in the community, community engagement, all that is kind of feels more like second place to we want the job prospect first. Cynthia? I think to <coughs> as a professional planners, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Okay, as professional planners, I think what we really have to do and look at in our communities is, you know, what, where are the areas in our communities that are kind of tired? Maybe they're not the highest and best use. Maybe we have, um, they're over-commercialized or over-retailized. And so you've got to look at those particular areas in your community as potential opportunities to really introduce more mixed-use development into the community and thereby allowing more affordable options. Because again, you know, the one thing that we're hearing as planners is, is walkability, um, vibrancy, the ability to live, work, and play in the same places within your community is key critical factors as attracting you know, the millennial generation as well as though new businesses. New businesses that are looking to put their corporate 
headquarters or you know start their business there they want to see this mix of opportunity and not have to rely on the car so then going back to brian and cynthia's comments um and the apa survey investing in place economic development in nevada has traditionally been uh, we're a low tax state how many people remember seeing the billboards or ads in magazines trying to attract California businesses to Nevada. It's come here because you can pay low to no taxes. So how do we take a look at creating that quality of place in an environment where we're taking a look at economic development being creating a place which may take more investment versus the or no taxes? And you know, this is a, a, a sort of Nevada development district. As you cross one county line to the next, going from say Humboldt County to Persian County, Persian County into Lyon County, Lyon County into Washoe Story County, you will have four or five or six, if you are dealing with municipalities at that point, different regulatory standards. And for each individual community you engage in, there is a business license fee, and there are development and impact fees, and there are sales taxes and property taxes that you have to collect. So I, I think from an economic development perspective, if you're the state of Nevada, one thing that you have to you know, kind of dispel the myth of is that we're low tax, low regulation, because the, the data doesn't bear that out. Um, instead, the question really is, you know, with the resources that are collected, how can you focus your investment, you know, to generate the highest possible return on investment for your community? And, you know, part of the, the issue for Nevada has been, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll just say this as a private citizen at this point, uh, we are still kind of very much stuck in the smokestack chasing policies of the 1950s and the 1960s, where you know we're happy to entice a firm that is already almost kind of at its peak development level, um, you know, from another state, as opposed to investing in a firm, you know, that will grow and employ individuals and, and become an industry leader long term. You know, from an economic development perspective, I always work, when working with communities, say it's far better, you know, instead of recruiting Microsoft to your community, than investing over the next 20 years in the company that will replace Microsoft. Um, you know, those firms are the ones that really tend to drive the, the economic base of your individual community. And, and part of that is also being sensitive to shifts in the national and, and really international economy. Um, you know, again, and this will be hard to say this in Clark County as well as Washoe County, but uh, as we were looking at location quotients and shift share analysis for the gaming industry in the state of Nevada relative to the nation, it's a mature industry, which means that there is not a lot of potential future growth in that one industry. Uh, and part of that has to do with decreased demand in gaming nationally. Uh, because individuals like Brian here, millennials, you know, as they begin to now enter the workforce and earn income, are allocating an increasing portion of their income away from that type of recreation and entertainment and consumption pattern towards other things. Yet, Nevada has an economic base system that is still fundamentally built on 1990s, 1980s, even 1950s approaches to economic development. So just get past that low tax, low regulation, you know, mantra, and really kind of get into the more substantial issues of economic development that confront us. I think a couple of the different things to look at too is, I mean, yes, maybe from a state or a uh, county or a local government jurisdiction, maybe the tax rate isn't that high that they're collecting, and they do have to turn to other fees, such as user fees, to, um, to gain some additional revenue to be able to implement certain programs. But I can tell you from working, you know, whether it's you know, across or around the world in the Middle East to even working in the Midwest, that um, the value of creating a space or creating this amenity infrastructure, you know, taking those hard-earned tax dollars, taking those user fees to really invest in these things are what's gonna drive economic development. Case in point, in Indianapolis, even though our downtown is very, very walkable, um, you still have trouble maneuvering via um, a bicycle or a car. 
And back in about 2005, Indianapolis decided they were going to make their community more bicycle friendly. They were going to also develop what was called the Indianapolis Cultural Trail. So linking seven different neighborhoods and cultural districts within that particular community. And based on that investment, as you know, the first leg of the trail was created, you started, you started to see speculation. People trying to determine where was the next neighborhood that I should invest in terms of housing. And you began to see businesses saying, I want to locate on the cultural trail. I want to have access because people can ride and walk their bikes in a safe manner because it's a de dedicated space. And at the end of the day, um, IUPUI, which is another partnership between um, Indiana University, Purdue University, and the um, Indiana chapter of the American Planning Association, they ended up, their economists did a study and found that property tax values double, or no, triple, to almost one billion dollars from the time that the trail was built, starting in 2007, until 2015. So one billion dollars of assessed value of property, not to mention all of the sales tax that the city is getting because they invested in the cultural trail. And in that particular case, the city spent zero dollars. It was a public private partnership with federal grants from the DOT as well as private investors so a community and a community foundation who generated all the funds nearly 80 million dollars to develop this entire cultural trail so we don't always have to look at our city governments to be able to fund their own trails or create these public spaces they need to be creative in how they capitalize and leverage various funding sources in order to build these places that businesses and millennials want to be. I would, I would add, I think, just add on to what Rick was saying. I think the mentality in Nevada has always been boomer bus, and we have to get past that boomer bus mentality. If you look at the um, income, or you know, our taxable income, and how income comes in for public projects and things like that, it all is variable. You know, especially look at the ballot this, this um, in 2016, both in the north and the south, you have two tax measures that are on there, and both offer variable tax, um, you know, basically a sales tax in Northern Nevada to, to go towards schools, um, which is going to, you know, thrive and die on, on a boom and bust economy. And then in the South, with fuel tax revenue uh, indexing, it, it too is going to ebb and flow depending on, on the boom and bust of the economy. So we got to get past that in order to get to a point where we can have uh, sustainable uh, funding sources so that we can look to to, to look at you know things like you know bike trails and you know things that, that make it a place rather than just um, constantly trying to play catch up um, in our, our financial situation. Our right. city legislature has to quit being dazzled. Well, seriously, yeah. that's the problem. I mean, we get dazzled by Tesla. Uh, so the county that it's located in doesn't take any impacts. County I live in is going to take a hell of an impact. Uh, you've got the hell of a car company down here that has every built a car. And then, you know, I haven't spoken to a person yet, I'm sorry if I offend anyone, who thought that the decision the legislature made last week was a good one. Um, and, and yet, our state legislature gets dazzled by that. Uh, and I don't know whether they get dazzled because, because they like to be dazzled or because there isn't any organization out there that they can turn to uh, and feel comfortable in asking as a neutral organization. Uh, when I was a chapter president, again, you know, when we were still regulating dinosaurs, uh, one of the things that the chapter recognized is that before it could be effective uh, as being, uh, assisting the legislature, it had to first be considered a neutral organization that provided uh, a perspective that did not necessarily um, <coughs> favor one, one or the other. Once that was done, then you could become maybe an effective lobbying organization. I mean, our planning laws date back to 1947. 1947, for crying a bucket, we're still planning as if we just recovered from World War II. And <coughs> trying to get the legislature to understand that part of the problem 
uh, of, of doing effective planning in this in this state is the fact that we work through some very anachronistic uh, planning laws. You know, they've cobbled the stuff together, uh, and there are things that are actually not too bad. But generally, uh, this state could use a major overhaul uh, and, and recognize that there is a linkage between a lot of different things, economic development, um, uh, health, health, uh, God, you don't plan for health at all. The state doesn't even have a state plan. Um, and so, I mean, these kind of some problems that, that I think we, we face, but as, an order, as a chapter, we first need to be considered uh, to have the opportunity to be seen as an organization that provides impartial, you know, like the answer you get, but at least impartial answers, professional answers, that take some of our local planners and state planners out of the mix. Now, honest to God, I can remember going down to the legislature and being told, well, don't go down there and testify on behalf of the APA because they don't see, they don't know who the hell the APA is. They do know that you work for a county, and they're going to consider you making that comment on behalf of the of the county. You know, I went down there anyway and made a brief statement on behalf of the organization. But I, this is one of the issues I think we have. And Cindy, you know, uh, I apologize for this next comment, but I don't see APA out there either. I mean, I watched three, three programs on PBS uh, that were planning related, and not once in those three one hour presentations that were very well done by PBS, PBS was there anyone from the American Planning Association consulted, commenting, asked to, asked to provide any perspective. I thought that was sad. Now, did the AIA have? Oh yeah. Did the ASLA have someone? Oh yeah. Did anyone from APA have? No. And, and so, you know, it's a fundamental problem that we need to get our name out there. We need to get it out there in such a manner that this is a series of professionals and citizen planners who have, can provide you with perspective that you may not like to hear it, but you can at least rely upon being honest and correct. So well, what's taking place at a national level and also at a local level, because as we heard earlier, the depth of planning experience here in the state, um, we don't have a planning program right now. So we're having to bring in people to the profession with various backgrounds and diverse backgrounds, and that can be an asset to us because we heard planning is an umbrella. We're being asked to do more. We're being asked to really rely. I mean, we have an economist on our staff too. Um, so. With, address, with addressing things like public health, um, how do we partner with public health, sociology, engineering, the education, academics, real estate, finance, because it's going to take all of us. We can't change the products that are being built and being offered. We can't improve housing choice, diversity. We can't do those things alone. So what are, what are we happening, what's happening on a national level and then at a local level to really engage these different groups and organizations? Well, I can talk about two things from the national level, I guess. First, let me address the partnerships. So, um, APA has a pretty robust partnership um, alliance that we have that we're working on and strengthening. So these are partnerships with ASLA, AIA, um, and there's two with the, the engineers, which I always get their acronyms messed up. So I'm AC, ACEC, and yes. I completely agree with you that APA is not always present and forefront at the mind of, you know, whether it was the flooding in Katrina, um, whether it was anything else that was happening. We're not always the go-to organization, but we are working very hard to try to raise that profile, to try to, across their radio stations. And of course, it was talking about the value of great places, great streets, and great neighborhoods and what planning had to do to build those because they don't understand the impacts. And that is where we as planners can come in and help to educate them. But you've really got to form <coughs> those particular relationships with them and their staffs so they trust you and the information that you're giving. But I think <coughs> from a local perspective for our state, um, a couple things. One, um, like I said, we have to get past the boom and bust mentality, we have to get past the north and south mentality to it, right. and, um, which is difficult, right, because there's 400 and some odd miles that separate our two urban areas, um, but from our chapter's health, um, from planning in the state, um, we have to speak as, at a state level and not a, this matters to the north or this matters to the south. So that's, I think, one thing in particular. And then secondly, um, 
in the short term, I think we have to write the coattails of uh, partner organizations uh, for, for whatever reason. Like Mike was saying, you know, at a PBS special, the architects and the landscape architects get, get the billing, uh, but planners uh, kind of get the shaft. And so that's where, it, 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 for, for whatever, you know, for, for whatever reason, and, and I think, you know, we can tell, but architects and landscape architects have done a better job at promoting their product, their product is the built environment largely, and they can point to it very easily. Planning is, is more policy. It's more un, un, in the intangibles uh, of our urban form. And so that's that's a communication effort that, that has to fall onto planners. And um, so I think locally, uh, in the short term, we need to write the hotels of some um, allied organizations like the architects and landscape architects and engineers and simultaneously work on our communication strategies so that we are communicating to uh, the residents of, the, of Nevada as well as legislators uh, uh, what, what actually goes into planning. Because the fact of the matter is all of those uh, legislators and local entities are engaged in planning across a whole wide spectrum of planning, not just land use, not just transportation, but um, economic development, financial planning, everything uh, in, in planning of their the fiscal impacts and things like that. So, that becomes a communication effort on our part. And I do think we have the albatross, unfortunately. Um, architects, engineers, well, maybe not as much engineers, but and landscape architects are not regulators. We are. I mean, you talk to anyone about, I'm a planner, but it's typically what you hear. Is, oh, you're the guy down the street allowed the fence too close to the street. So, you know, I agree that, yes, that's a part of our profession, but it's not necessarily the dominant part of our profession. And, and you know, I, I agree with Andy, it's, it's engaging of this, uh, increasing our profile that, that, you know, yes, you know, we do implement plans through regulation, um, but, and that was interestingly enough, I just see as a valuable thing, you know, in the 20s with Euclid versus Amber. But I, I would like to see us you know, step up the fact that, you know, we also talk about the future uh, of that and, and, and talk more about, more about that, present that, and yes, in partnership with architects. Uh, you know, I would get a kick out of architects. They never show any buildings beyond, beyond around the ones that they're building. It's like, it's like a building in this, in this vault where there's nothing else. <laughs> Mark, what do you have? I would say for what it's worth, I think we need to take a more prominent role in, in thinking. We heard this morning, I mean, DeVore laid out the plan for, for Boulder City in a very monumental way. We have, uh, you know, monuments and engineering, you know, just a couple miles away from here. And we have, and when you look at it, you know, in a regional context of what's, what's gone on, especially over the last week and over the last couple of years, you know, planners have not been in that same historic role. There's not, there isn't one person or one big advocate in our state, I think, and in, in, in many cases nationally, that really take that, that take that on. That can be pointed to that this is this is the plan. This this is a good uh, plan that was developed. I mean, you know, with a few cases here and there. I mean, the state the stadium was not put together by planners. It was put together by a number of different stakeholders in the guise of economic development and getting, getting the Raiders. The same thing with Faraday and, and with Tesla. Um, you know, what about all the transportation? What about all the infrastructure that, that goes to support it in the state? What uh, all the all the things that that benefit the community that create great uh, great communities or parts of communities in northern and southern Nevada? Yeah, that part is is been put put off to the people at uh, at Carson City who are elected to make these decisions and they're not planners. They're, they're elected to do a job but they're not putting the, the most important part, the planning, into big things like this. And I think maybe we need to, again, reflect back on where we've come from, you know, lo you know locally and what, what our role has been as planners and, and think about our leadership in the, in the profession for better development of the community. And, and we have a task ahead of us to make those connections. I know some engineering friends, and no disrespect, but I hear oftentimes uh, when 
you do a lot of planning, when's the doing going to start? And we joke a little bit that you can't do your doing and your construction projects unless you have a plan. And increasingly so, from the federal government side, I don't, know if I don't know if there's any comments, but when you're applying for grants and investments such as the trail that we heard about from Cynthia, the federal governments and the federal agencies are saying, we don't, we don't have enough money to give you $1 for a road project, $1 for a walkability project or economic development project. We have $1 to give you. How are you going to achieve multiple goals? So how are we going to think through, especially, you know, it might be a paradigm shift for us too, especially in an environment where you saw the majority of our planners here in the state are focused on regulatory type things. But how are we going to bring those different disciplines together and be able to think through those issues to be more relevant and to make sure we're at the forefront? And you know, maybe just to add, you know, a little bit of perspective, you know, to what you're pointing out, out about the resource side. Um, the, as part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act uh, that was passed out of the Great Recession uh, in 2008.